Let's read together our text for this evening. Zephaniah 1 verses 14 through 18. Zephaniah 1, 14 through 18. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against defensive cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. This morning, beloved, we saw that despite the foolish pretensions of the ungodly, this world's goal is the new heavens and the new earth, which will be ushered in by the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment for the wicked and salvation for the elect. The Old Testament treatment of the day of the Lord emphasizes judgment more than salvation. Zephaniah 1 exclusively deals with judgment and is designed to terrify the ungodly. The New Testament treatment of the day of the Lord and similar terms emphasizes salvation more than judgment. Why the difference? Because Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, has come and poured out the Holy Spirit. The day of the Lord brings judgment for all sins. We saw that this morning, including the sins of pride, false prophecy, and persecuting God's people. But in Zephaniah 1 verse 12, it is the sin of denying God's providence, his doing good, and his sending affliction. Even by people in the visible instituted church, and even in one's heart, that God judges on that dread day. The day of the Lord manifests God as the one who actively punishes as the one who is Jehovah, the I am that I am, and as the one who is angry at sin. In the New Testament, God is especially manifested in the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the day of the Lord, that is, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now some of you have noticed that the two sermon titles today on Zephaniah chapter 1 are very similar. The great day of the Lord in the morning and the day of the Lord in the evening. And you may well be wondering why. Well though both sermons basically focus on the same subject though there's different fresh material in them, as you will see, I didn't want to use for both sermons exactly the same title. Then you would have to say the title for the morning service is the day of the Lord, part one, and the evening service, the day of the Lord, part two. And it gets even more complicated in a series, for then we would have ended up Zephaniah and the day of the Lord, part three, consisting of the day of the Lord, part one, that's this morning, and Zephaniah and the day of the Lord, part four, 
and the day of the Lord part two. That's this evening. That's too complicated. I can see some of you wincing at that. And so we change the titles slightly. But there's also a different emphasis as well as different content in the two sermons today. The morning sermon was on the great day of the Lord. The exact wording of verse 14. The great judgment it brings. The great sin it punishes. The great God it manifests. The great day of the Lord. Now in the evening, our title is The Day of the Lord because we're going to focus on this end times or eschatological term itself. The Day of the Lord. We're going to look at the origin and connections of this conception, the Day of the Lord. Where did this technical term come from? When did it arise in Israel? Why? What is the extent or scope of the day of the Lord? Is it local? Is it universal? Is it cosmic? And the nearness of the day of the Lord. What does it mean that this day is near? As the scriptures repeatedly affirm that it is. Let's look then at the day of the Lord. Its origin, its extent or scope or range and its nearness. The origin, extent, and nearness of the day of the Lord. I hope at least some of you have your bulletin still to hand because the text on the back of the bulletin on the day of the Lord in the Old Testament are very helpful as regards the origin of the term itself. If you look at those quotes, even briefly, you will notice that the phrase, the day of the Lord, is not used in the earliest books of the Bible. The five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, don't use the term. Nor does the book of Job, which is dated around the time of the patriarchs. That's significant. The day of the Lord, as such, is not mentioned in the Old Testament historical books. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and in the three first and seconds, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, and Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Esther. The day of the Lord isn't even found as such in the Old Testament wisdom books. It's not in the Psalms of David. It's not in the books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, or the Canticles of Solomon. The technical term, the day of the Lord, is only used in all the Old Testament in what are called the writing prophets. It's found in four of the five major writing prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, but not Daniel. And it's found in six of the twelve minor writing prophets. And of these nine other writing prophets, three of them are before Zephaniah. Joel, Amos, and Isaiah use the term day of the Lord before Zephaniah. And yet even then, though they were the first prophets to use the term in Scripture, the term was well established in the people's minds, even in the northern kingdom, in Amos' day. Amos 5 verse 18 says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness, not light, for you wicked in the northern kingdom. But in that Amos says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. They had some idea, though not the correct conception, of what the day of the Lord was, and they wanted it to come. Therefore they knew something about it. 
Four of the writing prophets mention the day of the Lord during or slightly after Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Obadiah and Lamentations. Two of the prophets who mention the day of the Lord were a century or more after Zephaniah. They are Zechariah and Malachi, the last two quotes on the back of the bulletin. Here are some simple conclusions about this terminology of this key biblical term, which is central in any view of the end time, especially working from the Old Testament. It only occurs relatively late in Israel's history. In Scripture, it's only found in the writing prophets. And Zephaniah wasn't the first to use the term, nor was he the last writing prophet to use this technical, eschatological, or end times phrase. But that only takes us so far. How did this key eschatological technical term arise in God's special providence as regards Israel and by his inspiration. The answers I'm going to give now will fill out our idea of the term but they will be more suggestive than definitive. They're pointers, not the last word. Something for you to think about. could be argued that this term, the day of the Lord, arose in connection with the Old Testament feasts or festivals, or even the fasts. Turn with me, if you will, to Amos chapter 5. Amos 5, verses 18 and 20, mention the day of the Lord. A day characterized with regard to the wicked as a day of darkness and not light. The very next verse says, verse 21, God speaking, I hate, I despise your feast days and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. And so the day of the Lord here, it's the day when God comes to punish them For their wicked feast days. You have your own feast days. I have my day. And when my day comes. The day of the Lord. I will punish you. For your feast days. On which you. Exercise your wicked hearts. With will worship. Contrary to my word. Turn to Joel. Chapter 1. Joel is the book before Amos. Joel 1 verse 14 talks about a fast day. On a feast day you do some eating, although festival is a better word. On a fast day you avoid eating. Joel 1 verse 14 commands, Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, and bring together the elders of the inhabitants of the land into God's temple and cry to the Lord. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a day day of destruction from the Almighty shall it come. There's a fast day seeking deliverance from the day of the Lord. Staying in Joel, turn to Joel chapter 3. Joel 3 verse 12 deals with judgment day. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat means Jehovah judges. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. The day of judgment. Judgment day. And then verse 14 reads, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision... And the decision there is the decision of God. It's not an evangelistic appeal. 
It's the decision of God. It's the decision of God as judge. And the decision of the judge is a verdict. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of the verdict, the divine verdict. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of verdict. God is going to give his sentence against the ungodly pagans. And so I say, verse 12 is a day of judgment. And since God is the judge, it's called the day of the Lord. The day of judgment. God is judged the day of the Lord. So many feasts or fasts or days of judgment that are associated with the term the day of the Lord. But it's also connected to war. The day of war. And the day of war is when Jehovah fights with the ungodly armies against the people. A day of war when Jehovah fights through an army, is the day of Jehovah. Staying in Joel, chapter 2, now you can see why we read so much from Joel earlier. Joel 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. So that all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh and is nigh at hand. Verse 11. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? It's the day of war, when Jehovah fights in the war. And so it's the day of war, it's the day of Jehovah who wars against the people. You see this also in Zephaniah. Zephaniah 1 verse 14 says, The great day of the Lord is near. And in verse 16, we read that it is a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fence head, that is, fortified cities and against the high towers. That is, the day of the Lord is a day of war. When the Lord fights in the war against the wicked people. <clears throat> this day of the Lord is also intrinsically related to the whole concept of divine kingship. Remember this morning we saw in verse 12 that there was doubt regarding Jehovah's providential dealings to send good or to send affliction and misery. Verse 12 says at the end, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. And then in verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. and He's going to show himself as king, ruling over the earth, sending good according to his will, and punishing others according to his counsel. The day of the Lord pictures God as a king who acts and who makes his might known. You will remember from the first sermon in this series that Zephaniah, the Old Testament prophet, the one who refers most to the day of the Lord and who structures his whole book around this theme, unique for a minor prophet, was of a royal or kingly line in Israel. The day of the Lord connected with feasts and fasts. The days of those feasts and fasts. And the days of judgment. And the days of war. And the days of kingship. When he shows that he really does rule. The day of the Lord also in Zephaniah 1. And it's only here is connected even with the creation week. Because the day of the Lord in verse 14 is explored and explained in terms of six days, as it were, in verses 15 and 16. Follow with me as I read these verses. 
Verse 15 begins, That day, namely the day of the Lord, is one, a day of wrath. Two, a day of trouble and distress. Three, a day of wasteness and desolation. Four, a day of darkness and gloominess. Five, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Six, a day of the trumpet and alarm. So the additional six references to the one day, the day of the Lord, the day which will end the world, reminds us of the six days that began the world. And when the day of the Lord comes, the last day, it's actually very like the very first day when the world was without form, shapeless and void, lifeless, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. This day of the Lord, others think, and there's something to it, is also intrinsically related to the truth of God's covenant. I want you to think covenantally here. We saw in our first sermon in connection with verses 2 and 3 that this is an allusion to events around the Noahic covenant. Remember verses 2 and 3, God says he's going to utterly consume all things. Man and beast, the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea. That is, it's going to be like the flood, even worse than the flood, because the flood didn't drown the fish. But when God comes in the terrible dread day of the Lord, even the fish will die. I say, that's the Noahic covenant. Think to yourself about events in Genesis 6 through 9. Then in the second sermon in this series, they included verses 7 and 8, which we saw alluded to the Abrahamic covenant. Because those verses talk about the day of the Lord's sacrifice. And remind us of Genesis 15, when Abraham and God were there and the animals were divided asunder. God makes his own day of sacrifice. Think now, not Genesis 6 through 9, in a way it comes, moving forward a bit, Genesis 15 and the Abrahamic covenant. And now look at verses 15 and 16 and see there the terminology and ideas of the Mosaic covenant. The covenant with Moses. And now we're in the text of the third and fourth sermons in this series, this Lord's Day. What are the words used? That day is a day of wrath when God gave the law at Mount Sinai. The law worketh wrath. And that's why there was that terrible, awesome theophany with earthquakes and darkness because it's a visible representation and an audible representation of the wrath of God against all who break his law and who aren't found in Jesus Christ passage goes on to talk about a day of darkness and gloominess. There was thick darkness on the mount. It talks about clouds and thick clouds. There they were above Mount Forehead. Verse 16 refers to a day of the trumpet and the trumpet waxed loud. (coughs) Throw into the mix too the references to darkness and thick darkness. Think of the ninth plague. The plague of darkness. When people were so scared by the darkness that you could touch, that they were afraid even to move. Let's go through those terms. That day is a day of wrath. God's law has been broken. He's angry. It's a day of trouble and distress because God's wrath affects people so that they are troubled and distressed. It's a day of wasteness and desolation because God will come in his wrath 
to destroy the land, which will bring trouble and distress on the hearts and souls of mankind. It's a day of darkness and gloominess. Because it's a day of thick clouds and thick darkness that won't let any light in. It's a day of trumpet and alarm because the army of God's judgment (coughs) sweeps across the land. The day of the Lord then is a day when covenant punishments, the Noahic covenant punishment, the desolation of the earth, the Abrahamic covenant punishment, The sacrifice that rips apart the Mosaic covenant punishment. The thunder and wrath and darkness and devastation. The day of the Lord is the day when the covenant punishments set forth in Genesis and Exodus are meted out in a big, awesome To develop this idea of the covenant a little bit further. The day of the Lord is the day of God's covenant curses. Laid down in the books of Moses and especially in Deuteronomy 28. You may have recognized some of the language. And if you will, you can find in your Bibles Deuteronomy 28. And I'm going to refer to verses in that chapter and Zephaniah 1. And think to yourself, one is echoing the other. Zephaniah 1 verse 13, the second half says, They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. Sound familiar? This is Deuteronomy 28, verse 30. Second half of the verse. (coughs) Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Verse 39 of Deuteronomy 28 begins, Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink of the wine, nor gather the grapes. Zephaniah 1 is saying, this day of the Lord is the day in which the covenant curses in Deuteronomy 28 and elsewhere are poured forth upon you. Zephaniah 17 begins. Zephaniah 1 verse 17 begins. I will bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Now Deuteronomy 28, verses 28 and 29. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart, and thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness. He knew Deuteronomy 28, some of his hearers did too. And he takes the covenant curses that God threatened upon the covenant breaking people of Israel, and he says, the day of the Lord, that's the time when this heavy judgment is visited upon you. To gather all that together, I know there's a fair bit of content there, and that would work with a lot of scripture, but it's worthwhile, it's worthwhile making an effort because this is a big, practical, biblical topic. (coughs) This day of the Lord wasn't there as a term at the start, only came in later with the writing prophets. And it may well have arisen because it was seen as the day when the covenant curses are meted out, like those in Deuteronomy 28. A day when the covenant punishments associated with the Noahic, Abrahamic, and Mosaic covenant in Zephaniah 1 The day when those punishments are poured out fiercely and undeniably. The one last day, the day of the Lord, ends the world. Just as the first six days began the world at creation. And they both, the last day and the first day, involved blackness, darkness. 
desolation, no life, no shape, no form. You see again, the Bible's one book. It all hangs together. And on that day of the Lord, Jehovah especially manifests himself as the judge. The day of the Lord is the day of judgment because he's the judge. He manifests himself as the king. The day of the Lord is the day as the king because he shows that he rules by sending good in salvation and punishment in judgment. And it's the day of the Lord because the Lord is the warrior who fights against the disobedient. And on the day of the Lord, he punishes his people for their hypocritical festival days. So the people ought to seek Jehovah in repentance and faith on fast days. And as I said earlier, this is more suggestive than definitive. This isn't the last word. But it ties together biblical ideas and gets you thinking in the thought world of the prophet and of Israel in the Old Testament. And then again, it's hard to say how the idea arose or to prove that this came from this so maybe some of the things are not so much describing the origin of the day of the Lord but connections and links to the day of the Lord so do you see how these biblical concepts are related and coalesce in one let's move from the origin to the extent or scope of the day of the Lord. And if you look at the 21 passages on the back of the bulletin and their context, you will see that the extent or scope or range or sweep of the day of the Lord varies. Certain verses in their context really are dealing with especially with a local saint, just one nation. In Amos 5, we referred to it earlier, the day of the Lord comes upon the northern kingdom of Israel. Just that little country. You'll see Jeremiah 46, verse 10 on the page, and Ezekiel 30, verse 3, those two prophecies speak of the day of the Lord in judgment upon Egypt. And as you read them in their context, you'll see this is dealing with that country. Local references. There are other passages, when you study them, and study them in their context, you'll see that the day of the Lord is wider dealing with the Gentiles as a group and not just one nation. Let me read Obadiah 15, about two-thirds of the way down the page. And all these texts are arranged in biblical order. Obadiah 15. The day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. The day of the Lord is near upon all all the heathen. It's not local here. It's wider. Joel 3 verse 14 says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of verdict. God the judge is passing his sentence. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision or verdict. And the context makes it clear that it's dealing with many Gentile nations. There's your first two groups. Sometimes the day of the Lord is one people or nation. In other places, it's wider dealing with the Gentiles as a group. And in yet other passages, it's even wider yet, and not even merely international, the day of the Lord is cosmic. The very first verse on the page, Isaiah 2 verse 12. The day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon Every one that is proud and lofty. Not just in one country, not just in many countries, but everyone that's proud and lofty. And upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And the cosmic sweep 
of the day of the Lord here is even clearer if you read the context, which is roughly the second half of Isaiah chapter 2. Not local, not merely international, dealing with the Gentiles, but cosmic. Joel 2 verse 31 is similar. Joel 2 verse 31 states, The sun shall be turned into darkness. So it's not just Egypt or several Gentile nations, but even the whole created order embracing outer space. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Local, international involving the Gentiles and other passages, it's very obviously cosmic. And then there are other passages where it deals with the local, small scale, and the cosmic, widest scale, both together. Turn with me to Isaiah 13. This is important. You read the Bible and you want to know what am I reading? How am I to interpret this? Isaiah 13, the very first verse tells you that this is, quote, the burden of Babylon. There are many passages that give us that local flavor. It's dealing with the day of the Lord upon Babylon. The day of the Lord is mentioned in verses 6 and 9. And then notice the cosmic aspects. Verse 10, Isaiah 13, verse 10. The stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Verse 13. Therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. It's local, Babylon. And it's cosmic. It's both. The two are blended. That's the key word. Turn over to Isaiah 34. We see the same thing again. Isaiah 34, verses 5 and 6, mention Idumea, another word for Edom. That's the local aspect. Now follow the first few verses. Isaiah 34, verse 1. Come near ye nations to hear, and hearken ye people, let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it, and somebody could say, well, it's calling on everybody to hear what God's going to do to one nation on the day of the Lord, Edom. But the next verse makes it clear. The indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And then we move to the cosmic. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. And the post-millennialists will come to you and say, oh, that's just metaphorical language. But it's not. It's language used at the end of the world, cosmically, in the Old and in the New Testament. So having laid out the options and the scope from the day of the Lord prophecies in the Old Testament, sometimes local, sometimes international, the Gentiles, sometimes cosmic, sometimes both local and cosmic, what about Zephaniah 1? What's the extent or scope or range or sweep of the day of the Lord in our chapter? Well, there are some things in Zephaniah 1 which are definitely local, referring to the southern kingdom. Verse 12 says that God is going to come with his candle or lamp and search 
Jerusalem. Okay. Verse 13 says that their goods and property and houses and vineyards will be taken from. Them. Verse 16 refers to their fortified cities and high towers upon their walls. Local. Southern Kingdom of Judah. But there are hints at the more universal in our text. Verse 17 says, I will bring distress upon men. Could be the men of Judah, but maybe it's pointing to something wider. Verse 18 says that God will bring his wrath upon the whole land. Maybe that's the whole land of Judah, or maybe it's the whole land, the world. I wouldn't read too much into that, but there's a certain openness. But now especially the proof comes with regard to this cosmic day of the Lord by the first two verses of chapter 1 after the heading. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and even the fishes of the sea. And that's as cosmic as the flood. And we don't believe the Genesis 6 and following deeds with a local flood. It's a universal flood. And this is dealing with the universal day of the Lord. The cosmic day of the Lord. Zephaniah 1 then, like several other passages that I've mentioned, blends together the local and historical fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians in 586 or 587 BC. It blends the local and historical over 2500 years ago and the cosmic and future day of the Lord at the end of of the world with the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I say to you, this is common in the Bible and a key interpretive method of grasping the meaning of God's word because you have it in the New Testament. You have it in the New Testament in the longest passage where our Lord Jesus Christ teaches about eschatology and the end of the world. I'm referring to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 blends two things. There's the fall of, the, of Jerusalem to the Romans in AD 70. To us, that's in the past. And there's the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is in the future. AD 70 is a pointer to the second coming of Christ. And if you don't get that straight, you'll end up in one of the erroneous millennial schools. That's how important it is. But let's move on. Let's come to the issue of nearness. The nearness of the day of the Lord is mentioned in about a third of the passages on the back of the book. About a third of them mention the day of the Lord as being near. I'm going to quote the key phrases. The day of the Lord is at hand. Isaiah 13 verse 6. Ezekiel 30 verse 3, the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. Joel, and we read all of these parts earlier and deliberately, Joel lays great stress upon the nearness of the day of the Lord. It's at hand, chapter 1 verse 15. It's nigh at hand, 2 verse 1. It is near, 3 verse 14. Obadiah 15 begins... For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. So it's no surprise to you that Zephaniah, in full accord with the great prophetic teaching of the day of the Lord and the writing prophets, Zephaniah also stresses the nearness of the day of the Lord in chapter 1. Two weeks ago we noted chapter 1 verse 7. The day of the Lord is at hand. And especially strong is the emphasis in verse 14 at the very start. The day of the Lord, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Three times. 
three times it talks about its nearness. And this is the most emphatic statement anywhere in the Old Testament about the nearness of the day of the Lord. The great day of the Lord is near. Did you hear it? It is near. Did you miss it? It hasteth greatly. And you say to yourself, Zephaniah, we heard you the first time. We know what you're saying. Do you have to repeat it? Yes, I do. I'm making it emphatic so you won't miss it. It's near. It hasteth greatly. It's at hand, the day of the Lord. Does this sound familiar to you? If in your Bible reading for the calendar year 2015, you're on a scheme that's only New Testament. Or if this past several months you've only been reading the New Testament. Or if you've lost your full Bible and all you have is a Gideon's New Testament. Or if you so love the New Testament you don't go into the Old Testament. I don't recommend any of those things of course. But this should still be familiar to you. I'm going to give you some of the New Testament language about the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is near nearer than when we first believed Romans 13 it is at hand it draweth nigh it is approaching Hebrews 10 25 these are things which must shortly come to pass Revelation Jesus Christ says in that last book of the Bible behold I come quickly you see it The unity of Scripture. The unity of the Old Testament. The unity of the New Testament. The unity of the Old and New Testaments in their teaching on the day of the Lord and its nearness with the New Testament taking over this Old Testament concept, relating it to Jesus Christ, developing it, unfolding it, and even laying greater stress upon the nearness. Because the day of the Lord is nearer now than it ever was in the Old Testament. It's near. Then the question is, this is always the question when you deal with the nearness of the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we understand this nearness? Well, very obviously, I'm thinking now especially of these Old Testament references to nearness, it was very obviously and even chronologically near in that these prophecies of nearness often had respect to a concrete local or international event. Isaiah 13 refers to the fall of Babylon and it says that that was near. It's at hand, verse 6 says. Oh yeah, only a few more years to go, a few short decades and that city collapsed into rubble. The fall of Jerusalem is prophesied locally, historically in Zephaniah 1. And Zephaniah was a few decades from the Babylonian defeat of God's people in that city. So that's very obviously near by anyone's understanding because it's chronologically near. That is near in point of time and years. But the key issue is what of the ultimate day of the Lord, the highest day of the Lord, to which all these other destructions and desolations upon Egypt or the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom or Babylon all pointed. What about the nearness of that day? How do we understand that? I'm going to give you some pointers. You could give a whole lecture on this, so I've had to be ruthless and leave bits out. Here's some of the explanations. There is no other redemptive event to come before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Other things have to come, but there is no redemptive event that has to come. Jesus Christ has been born. He has died on the cross for our sins. He has risen from the dead for our justification. He has ascended up into heaven as the head of the church. He sits at God's right hand ruling over all things as a prince and saviour. His next great redemptive event is to come in the clouds of heaven. The Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the church in the day of Pente- on the day of Pentecost. 
he too has no other great redemptive event to do. Here's another perspective, or rather, God's perspective on time, dealing with this precise issue in 2 Peter chapter 3. The scoffers were saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have done since the beginning of the creation. And part of Peter's answer in 2 Peter 3 is, but with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day. God's perspective is the eternal one as the creator of time is very different from your view of fastness and slowness. Now turn with turn with me to Matthew twenty four and twenty five. Matthew twenty four and twenty five. These chapters, Christ's longest teaching on the end of the world, has mentioned that Christ's coming is near. But then read Matthew. 24 verse 48 but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart my lord delayeth his coming so whatever near means or at hand it also allows for an apparent our perspective delaying of his coming chapter 25 verse 5 while the bridegroom tarried They all slumbered and slept. Verse 14. The kingdom of heaven is as a man. This refers especially to Christ in the parable. Traveling into a far country. It's explained in verse 19. After a long time. The Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. So the Bible says that Christ's coming is near and is at hand. And it also says that Christ going on a long journey and he's away a long time and people are very apt to think that he delays. So whatever the nearness means, it's not 20 or 30 years, never mind 20 or 30 months. I could look at Old Testament texts, but I forbear now, which use the short time and near. And even in these Old Testament texts, it refers to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Paul dealt with it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Some people misunderstood the nearness of Christ's coming to think that Jesus Christ could arrive with the postman tomorrow. And he said, but there must come the great falling away first. And then the man of sin must be revealed. And then Christ will come to destroy the final great antichrist. So certain things have to happen first. Not the great redemptive things of which I spoke earlier, but other things must happen first. Other signs must be fulfilled. That's a brief explanation. And it's enough to deal with nearness in this context in Zephaniah chapter 1. Word of time, so I can only say with regard to application that the application of this truth comes in the next text. That is, Zephaniah 2, verses 1 through 3. Zephaniah 1, the passage we look at, is instruction. And this has been an instructive sermon. Zephaniah 2, 1 through 3, the next text is application. And the next text will apply these truths. Well, they can't leave it solely at that. The application is here, as always, watch. Watch for the day of the Lord, which is also the day of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who redeemed you by his blood on the cross. Watch and pray, and watch and be ready. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, teach us the fear of thy name, and the greatness of the day of the Lord, that we may be ready, and that we, Lord, may honor thee and understand the Scriptures. Bless us in our fellowship this evening, in this coming week, and may we be watchful for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.